Hi everybody, my name is Scott McLeod. I'm a professor of school leadership at the University of Colorado, Denver. I wanted to talk with you for just a few minutes about why school might look a little different these days. And in order to do that, I'm gonna start with one of my favorite stories uh, about a girl named Martha. Martha was age nine uh, in Scotland and she decided that she was sort of unhappy with her school lunches. So she started bringing her digital camera to school every day and taking pictures of what they were feeding her. And like any sort of you know good young budding foodie, she decided to post those pictures on a blog and she had various rating scales, everything from six out of 10 on the foodometer, four out of 10 on the health rating. She even had a pieces of hair rating, which luckily for this meal was zero, right? And she just kept posting pictures over lunch over and over again and kids around the world started finding her and they started sending her pictures of their school lunches, you know? So here's lunch from Taiwan and here's lunch from, Canada and here's lunch from the Czech Republic and you know, Martha had a great run. You know, by the time she was done, she had met famous chefs like Jamie Oliver. She had appeared on the BBC and wrote a little book. She won Scotland's Public Campaigner of the Year award. She even got to meet Bean. Like all the great things happened, right? And Martha even used her platform to raise over $220,000 to set up a food kitchen in Malawi for the food insecure, which is pretty great. That's pretty powerful from a nine-year-old, right? He just had a digital camera and a blog. And I think it speaks to the power and presence of what's possible with young people these days when we unleash them with some new learning possibilities. And the great thing about the time that we live in is that there's actually millions of Marthas out there, right? Here's a young person named Josh in Iowa who started creating Pokemon video game walkthrough videos where he would narrate the game as he played it and offers various tips and suggestions. And as you can see, by the time he was heading into college, he had already had 83 million views on his videos, had 131,000 regular subscribers. It's pretty cool. Uh, here's a middle schooler named Kayla. Uh, she's a writer, right? And you can see that already by age 13, she's already written half a million words. She's got almost 5,000 reviews. She's writing about her favorite characters in, from books and movies and TV shows, you know, Harry Potter, Percy Jackson, and so on. Um, this is Matthew. He's age 11. He decided that he was concerned that boys his age weren't reading enough, so he decided to make his own blog, sort of Amazon review style, where he would share out books that he thought were interesting to other boys his age. Uh, this is Zev. He's a phenomenal photographer at age 14 in Massachusetts. As you can see, he takes some really interesting self-portraits. This is Cassandra. She's a middle schooler in California. She makes these little stuffed creations and then sells them online. She used to sell them on Etsy and then decided apparently that they were taking too much of a cut. So she set up her own direct-to-consumer website uh, as a middle schooler. Pretty impressive, right? And I think, you know, the point of this is that we have young people everywhere who are really comfortable living in these digital spaces, living on these online platforms, using these tools in productive and often fascinating ways. And I think one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves as adults is, do we even recognize how the young people around us are using technology at home in some very interesting ways? So that would be a great discussion to have with some of the young people in your life, right? And try to unpack not just the surface level stuff like what video games are you playing, but who are you connecting with? Who are you learning from? How are you contributing and sharing in online communities? Those are the kinds of questions that can create a really rich dialogue at home. You know, as somebody who's 53 years old now, I recognize that this kind of learning that I've been exhibiting so far is very different from what I grew up with, right? I grew up with teacher lecture and taking notes at my desk, reading chapters out of textbooks and, or maybe doing review problems. I did a whole bunch of worksheets and so on. And, you know, I think about the kind of learning that's available to our young people these days. Uh, at least at home, they get a chance to, you know, if they have a computer and some internet access, to learn about whatever they want. They can go in whatever directions they wish. They can go as deep as they want. They can connect with other people who are interested and passionate about the same topics. Um, they can create and make and do and share and collaborate in those digital and online spaces. Um, and they can really sort of figure out how do they become valued members of whatever communities they care about. And so they really sort of tasted the honey in terms of what it means to be a powerful learner. And then they often come to school 
and they don't get to do much of that. You know, they're still stuck in some of those older paradigms of learning and teaching like I had when I was a kid. And then, you know, unsurprisingly, their lack of engagement in their learning is pretty high. So, you know, here's some national level data that you're looking at. You know, it's not too bad in elementary school. You know, about three out of every four fifth graders say they're engaged in their learning, but we've already lost one out of four, which isn't great. And then as you go up the grades, you can see you're lucky if one out of three high school kids says, yes, my learning is interesting and engaging. And, you know, there's some follow-up questions that we can ask that inform us further. Right? Are you getting to learn things that are interesting to you? Are you having fun? Are you getting to do what you do best? Um, and the answers routinely are sort of no, no, and no. So I think, you know, a second open question for all of us as adults who care about the young people in our lives and in our communities is how might we tap into some of these new powerful learning modalities that are out there and at school, not just at home. Right? So we have a lot of schools who are diving into this in various ways. So depending on what school building you walk into, you might see five-year-olds who are connecting with other kindergartners all around the world, right? They're using class accounts in Twitter and other social media profiles to connect with and learn from and with each other. You know, it's awesome to see a five-year-old global citizen, for example. You might see middle schoolers who are creating their own apps to solve real-world problems, or they might be creating, you know, virtual worlds um, as they think about ecological sustainability or other important concepts in school. You might walk into a high school. You might see, you know, students in science class who are built their own hoverboards and are, you know, riding them down the hallway of the high school, or maybe they're outside creating their own aircraft or drones or whatever. You might even be discovering asteroids, depending on where you are. You know, you might even walk into a drama class and they're learning some kind of complex uh, material like, you know, the Greek play Ovid's Metamorphoses, but they're doing that by combining live acting and digital puppets and voiceovers and video game scenes and then performing that mishmash of digital and personal for live audiences at a local theater. And they call it Grand Theft Ovid. Like, wow, like that's pretty cool, right? And that's happening in Connecticut. Um, and so there's all kinds of possibilities that we might see when we walk into schools where there's some really interesting but also different learning is occurring. And I think a third great question for us as family members and community members is how do we support these new forms of learning and what kind of value are they adding to um, our, you know, the experiences of, of our young people. Now there's reasons why we're moving in this direction. So for instance, one of the big reasons is that we have a new information landscape that's floating out there. You know, most of us who are older like me grew up in an ink on paper landscape. Uh, it was books, magazines, um, newspapers. There were a few channels on the television. We had radio, right? <laughs> um, and, and that was great, but you know, most people didn't get to be publishers. They didn't get to be creators. Most of us were just consumers and you know, watching the few anointed experts that were out there that decided to share with us. But now, of course, our new information landscape looks much more like on the right. And we haven't lost any of those old modalities, but now we have digital bits floating around in the ether. We have the internet, we have social media, we have online learning platforms and websites and apps on our phone and laptop computers and tablets and so on, right? And anybody can publish and uh, it doesn't, it's not very expensive, right? Most of us could have our own newspaper or magazine if we wanted. It's called a, a free blog. We could have our own radio show if we wanted. It's called a podcast. We could have our own TV show if we wanted. It's called YouTube and so on, right? And we're all creating, participating, and sharing in real time and interacting with each other. And we can reach people all over the world that we never could reach before. And that's a very different information landscape. And trying to prepare students for that um, is some really complex work. And so that's one of the reasons why we're moving these directions. Second reason we're going this direction is because we're discovering that uh, workforce needs are changing quite a bit. So you have a complicated graph on the screen right now. And, to make it simple, I'm just going to point out that those blue and green lines on the graph are sort of those complex thinking and problem solving skills where you have really good analytical uh, competencies or really great interpersonal, you know, relationships with other competencies. And, you know, the number of jobs that require the upper level thinking work um, have grown steadily in the United States um, and other developed countries for the last many decades, right? So if you have those skills, you have a decent shot at a middle class 
uh, life and able to raise a family, afford a car, retirement, health care, and so on. But if you're involved in any kind of routine mental work or any kind of manual labor, you can see those other three lines on the graph have declined steadily over the last few decades. The number of job opportunities that require those skills uh, are just less because we've either offshored those jobs overseas to where people are paid less, we've outsourced those jobs from in-house uh, to some kind of outside contractor and it's become gig work, or we have maybe even automated them with robots or software or whatever, right? And so, you know, we have a number of schools who are trying to figure out how do we prepare more graduates with those upper level thinking skills and interpersonal skills um, so they have a, a decent chance at, you know, raising a family and, and life success and so on. So, you know, I think what we see here is that society, of course, continues to change quite rapidly in this digital global era that we now live in. That's the green line that you're looking at here. And many schools are sort of struggling to keep up, right? And that creates relevance gaps for us where, you know, we sort of see and understand that what society needs from us, what our communities and our kids need from us um, is different than from what schools are able to provide. And so schools are sort of trying to catch up, right? And by doing that, they're emphasizing more of this kind of stuff, right? We want students and graduates who are thinkers and problem solvers, who are great communicators and collaborators, who can really drive their own work and their own learning. Uh, we want them to be information literate. We want them to be technology fluent. We need them to be globally aware and fluent with other cultures because they're interacting with those people every day. And we need them to be innovators who can create value for themselves and for the organizations in which they work. So, you know, a fourth great question for us to think about um, as families and community members is, what are those skills and competencies that graduates really need these days for life success? And that can spark a really great conversation in your community. So I think I'm gonna close with this story. Um, this is Lake Titicaca in Peru. It's up in the Andean Mountains. I live in Colorado, so I'm used to high elevation up here. and. You know, Lake Titicaca is about 12,500 feet above sea level. And unfortunately, their wild frog population has declined about 80% over the last three generations. It's now classified as critically endangered. Um, so there's some scientists here at the Denver Zoo who are working with some scientific colleagues in Peru and are trying to preserve the species. Uh, one of the challenges about researching these frogs is that um, it's really difficult to scuba dive at altitude. All of the you know, sort of standard decompression tables for scuba divers are presumed at sea level pressure and so on. And so, you know, as you go up in altitude, you have increased decompression stress on divers. And so a basic rule of thumb if you're driving, if you're diving at altitude is to stay shallow and keep it short to limit the amount of accumulated gas in your body tissues. Um, so we've got some students here in Colorado who are working with these scientists, both at the Denver Zoo and in Peru, where they're trying to figure out what do aquatic robotics look like, where we can collect data and analyze the environment that these frogs are living in, both at the surface level and underwater. And what you see here is you see sort of a white underwater robot there on the table that can go down and collect water salinity and chemical composition and other data about the liquid environment that these frogs are in. And then also service level robots like the ones with the red and yellow pontoons that can collect other kinds of data and so on. And then, you know, in addition to the scientific data collection work, students are also working on frog conservation messaging and amphibian education activities, including a Spanish language comic book that explains the science to locals and why they should care. It's a really neat project, right? These aren't like super A plus students. These are just like students who care about the topic and want to try and make a difference. Uh, many of them, uh, their primary language is not English, and so they're using their Spanish speaking skills as an asset as they communicate with the scientists in Peru and so on. Um, and they're doing some really neat math work and robotics work and science work and writing work and speaking and listening work. And, you know, for me, I just keep thinking, you know, don't we want our young people to have more of this kind of learning? And I think most of us really do. And so don't be surprised if you walk into your local school building and you see school looking a little bit different these days. Uh, this is why. And so I hope that you're able to support the work that's happening in your local schools. Thank you very much. Please stay in touch. Thanks for spending a little bit of time with me today. Take care.